and welcome to Arbitration Conversation. So this time we're going to have a really interesting discussion with a true international leader in arbitration. Dr. Wahab Abdel, he is he's a, a fellow of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, which is how I know him, but he's been in arbitration a very long time. He chairs the department at Cairo University for private international law, and he's also a vice president of the ICC court, and he's been heavily involved in oil and gas arbitration as well as construction arbitration. So I was hoping that we could have a 10-minute talk about kind of an update on what's happening in Cairo, but also to talk about hot issues in arbitration generally when it comes to oil and gas and construction. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Amy. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, and of course, as part of our practice in the firm, Zulfi Karam Partners, I had the uh, arbitration, construction and oil and gas groups. And let me start by giving you an update about arbitration in Egypt generally, uh, before COVID-19, during COVID-19 and hopefully even afterwards. Uh, Egypt has a very strong arbitration culture with an international dimension, I have to say. We have, of course, cases under the auspices of the ICC, uh, LCIA, and other major institutions. And we have also the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration, which uh, administers domestic and international arbitration cases in accordance with uh, international standards. Uh, it's, of course, founded by ALCO, which is the Afro-Asian uh, legal consultation uh, committee, consultative committee, which is now an organization uh, in order to advance and develop dispute resolution generally and out of court processes. Um, and it's uh, the Cairo Center rules are modeled on the answer trial, but adapted to institutional arbitration uh, and uh, quite uh, modern in terms of uh, dealing with international cases. But more on the uh, uh, arbitration side in Egypt, we have our arbitration law, which is one of the oldest uh, in the region, if not the oldest. Uh, it was enacted in 1994, law number 27 of 1994, uh, inspired by the ancestral uh, model law. And uh, uh, it covers all aspects of the arbitration proceedings uh, 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 to a large extent in accordance with uh, good practices. Um, arbitration in Egypt is not just domestic, but it involves parties from all over and across the board. Uh, in many instances, it's uh, one of the hubs in the MENA region for international arbitration, together with the UAE. Now, we all know as well that the UAE have modernized their legislative infrastructure and have enacted their new law, law number six of 2018, uh, which is a, a, a good uh, uh, legislation in this respect. Uh, but in terms of Egypt, um, we also have courts that are uh, familiar with international arbitration and best practices therein. Uh, in recent years, and these are the developments that are worthy of note, the Court of Cassation specifically uh, has been very supportive of arbitration, uh, has shown understanding of hot and intricate topics in relation to extension of arbitration agreement to third parties, where they have rendered recently in 2018 a decision clarifying the principles and concepts on the basis of which extension could be granted and that it's consent that counts, not necessarily uh, having a signatory as such. So the courts have uh, broadened the scope in terms of looking at who consented to arbitration rather than who provided a signature to an arbitration agreement. That's so especially interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting because it flows with a recent U.S. Supreme Court case, which also condones this kind of application of essentially estoppel for third parties. Exactly. And, and you mentioned estoppel, which is quite interesting because we've had our uh, Court of Appeal in 2013 in one of the landmark judgments by the Court of Appeal, which has as well good judges in supporting arbitration, uh, has specifically addressed estoppel by saying it's a general principle of law. And I realize that estoppel in common law may have a different connotation and more applications than in civil law, but Islamic Sharia, which is the basis on which the court have found that estoppel is a general principle of law, said that a party cannot revoke what it has previously consented to or negate its past actions which we consider to be a variant of good faith in a way. So estoppel, yeah. good faith, abuse of rights yeah. are amongst the principles that courts rely upon and use. Um, so again, this is a judgment since 2013 onwards, 
courts have consistently then looked at estoppel in this respect. Uh, so in addition to that, the court has also, the Court of Cassation has very recently, in 2019, issued two judgments, which are quite interesting. The first one uh, relates to defining what an arbitral institution is uh, oh, okay. to ensure that no sham awards and no institutions operating in the dark would uh, 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 showcase themselves as credible institutions. And it used the ICC as a benchmark for an international arbitration institution. So this was, again, a landmark judgment. Um, in a third case, they addressed as well the internationalization of arbitration in Egypt, and they resorted to a very uh, innovative criterion uh, captured by the law, whereby if you go for institutional arbitration, this could be perceived as an international case, even if it's seated in Egypt, uh, which again is very helpful and uh, uh, shows how courts are supportive of arbitration. In addition to that, which is of comfort, courts have been very reluctant to review awards on the merits. And courts have, uh, again, adopted the uniform rule that awards will not be reviewed on the merits, even if the tribunal has got it wrong on the law. Uh, now, this is a very fine line because most recently, the Court of Appeal has rendered a decision involving uh, Libya and uh, uh, a Kuwaiti investor. It was, the, the, the judgment was rendered under the uh, Unified Arab Investment Treaty. Uh, and then it was challenged uh, in, before the Cairo Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal has twice declined to set aside the award because under the convention, uh, the mechanism does not permit a nullity or setting aside. Uh, but then it went to the Court of Cassation and the Court of Cassation has remanded the case twice to the Court of Appeal back, saying that you need first to establish whether you have jurisdiction to look into the case or not. And then this brought us to the latest installment, which is on June 3rd, 2020. So it's a very new decision, uh, where another circuit of the Court of Appeal has annulled this $1 billion uh, award. Wow, well, that was a bad day for the people. <laughs> uh, it is, it is. But of course, you know, uh, Libya has been, you know, showcasing this, that they have managed to uh, uh, set aside the award. Now, of course, there are enforcement proceedings in France, and France, we know, adopts the delocalization theory where they do not necessarily uphold what courts of the seat have found. Now, mm -hmm. I'm sure there will be a final chapter in these proceedings when finally the judgment of the Court of Appeal is challenged before the Court of Cassation. The reason being is that I think the Court of Cassation now has to consider a number of issues because the Egyptian arbitration law, the first provision of the law states that the provisions of this act are without prejudice to any international convention to which Egypt is a party. So international conventions prevail. And this then takes us back to the Unified Arab Investment Treaty to which Egypt is a party and in accordance with which the arbitral award was rendered. And there are a number of provisions under that treaty which does, do not provide for any vacator or setting aside actions or motions. Uh, in fact, one of the provisions expressly state that the Arab Investment Court can be seized uh, if within three months the award has not been enforced to ensure or provide measures to enforce the award. Uh, there is no reference to any challenge. In fact, the, the treaty states the award is final and not subject to appeal or challenge of any sort. Uh, now, of course, this then begs the question of how the Court of Cassation will deal with that and what norms the court will apply in terms of construing and applying the terms of the treaty in this regard. But it, it could be likely that uh, the decision of the Court of Appeal would be reversed and the award may be upheld. Uh, now, of course, the Court of Appeal has stated in the decision that it does not review the award on the merit, but they looked at large and said one of the fundamental principles is that compensation is only a remedy for reparation and not a penalty. And they have casted skepticism on the findings of the tribunal regarding the compensation, which to many would be an element of reviewing the merits. But the court said that on a prima facie basis, 
it looks as if that there is a breach of public policy. Now, of course, this is something that people can disagree on, uh, but, and we will see what the Court of Cassation would uh, say and provide in this regard. Uh, another interesting development uh, is that we've had for the first time ever a couple of years ago, a decision whereby the Court of Appeal and supported by the Court of Cassation have enforced an order for enforcement of interim measures for the first time. And it's an order, it's not an award. So it was uh, uh, rendered in the form of an order and for the first time the courts have enforced that, not waiting for a final award. Right. Well, it's interesting how these developments really do conform with similar developments in the United States and with the Supreme Court being very pro-enforcement, allowing for application of these exact same estoppel principles like you know it. I mean, really, it's the same ideas behind it. It's almost that whole sort of international lex mercatoria or whatever you want to call it, but it is applicable here as well. And we see this kind of pro-enforcement lens coming across the globe, I guess. Um, yeah. Have you seen any difference or distinction between investment treaty arbitration and just regular private contractual arbitrations? Is there any That's difference? That's a very good point. Now, investment treaty arbitration, you know, it, it has its own uh, culture and norms and principles to govern. Uh, and the latest judgment that I was mentioning to you, it was an Arab investment treaty. So that's a treaty award. Um, but other than that, in many instances, like exit awards would not be reviewed by national courts, as you know. Uh, and of course, in many of the investment proceedings, and Egypt has been very well versed in investment arbitration because of the number of claims that have been filed recent years, post 2011 onwards. Um, we have had our fair share of cases. Uh, but in any event, they are mostly seated abroad, uh, primarily uh, Paris, London, uh, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. So in essence, these are the jurisdictions where courts would be seized to look into the award if the regime under which the proceedings were commenced allow for that, like the ancestral, uh, for example, arbitration rules, which are used to administer arbitration proceedings. Um, so in essence, Egyptian courts have not had an opportunity to express views on um, investment decisions for the purpose of setting aside other than the very few instances, including the latest one regarding uh, Kharafi versus Libya. Uh, but um, the courts do understand the distinction and that there could be different uh, legal instruments governing these uh, uh, awards and they would be subject then to these norms accordingly. Um, one very uh, uh, interesting and recent case, which again has been uh, publicized globally, and which now I understand has an element uh, before U.S. courts, is that there was a decision rendered under the auspices of a uh, domestic arbitral institution uh, involving a major oil and gas company in uh, excess of $20 billion or so. And the courts have found that this is a sham award and uh, sentences, of course, have been passed against those involved uh, in relation to what the court have found to be a criminal a scheme of reality, in essence. Uh, and so, again, uh, an element that courts are quite balanced uh, in this regard and looking effectively to safeguard and protect the credibility of international arbitration. Now, on the construction and oil and gas front, Egypt is an, a, a major uh, North African oil and gas state. And uh, ever since uh, 2011 onwards, construction has been a major sector of interest uh, with many, many landmark uh, uh, projects in Egypt, including the broadening of the Suez Canal, uh, building the largest museum in the world, which is the Egyptian Museum that is going now to be next to, close to the pyramids. Um, so these are projects. And as you know, construction projects are dispute oriented. <laughs> and uh, you have, of course, cases about extension of time, uh, LDs, uh, costs, uh, uh, payment of entitlements to contractors and subcontractors. And having been involved in, in, in numerous construction arbitrations uh, in Egypt and throughout the MENA region uh, and beyond, I think we have a fair share and courts have developed a fair share of understanding of these construction arbitration cases. 
And it's very rare to say that courts have annulled uh, awards in this regard. Uh, one example is that we have not had a single ICC uh, or LCIA awards that have been annulled by Egyptian courts. We've had few instances where uh, the Cairo Center, uh, awards rendered under the Cairo Center have been uh, annulled, but mostly in domestic cases. And of course, the reason for that may be that tribunals have not been uh, very careful in rendering their awards. And we know one of the, the issues that sets the, the uh, uh, institutions apart is that the ICC has the scrutiny. So awards are scrutinized before they are rendered, whereas the Cairo Center does not have the scrutiny option. So there is no filter before the award is rendered in a way. Um, so uh, by and large, uh, developments are ongoing. Uh, courts and judges are quite supportive of arbitration. Uh, even judges when they retired and sometimes when they're sitting, they sit as arbitrators, which has to a large extent reduced the perceived competition between courts and arbitration and create a positive environment of understanding of the arbitration culture. And of course, we're talking about credible arbitration practices. Um, yeah. and, and one aspect that has helped with the development of international uh, arbitration in Egypt is that Egyptian law has influenced a wide variety of legal systems within the MENA region. So it had a, a great influence on many of uh, our uh, neighboring friends and colleagues in the Gulf countries uh, and in uh, North Africa. Wow, this is really interesting. And I love considering where this kind of fits in with the larger scope of international arbitration and how US law is actually moving in the same directions. Um, we're seeing a lot of that. And definitely in areas like construction where it's been historically, I mean, arbitration has been the main way that you resolve disputes in those particular areas. So thank you for taking the time with us today. This has been really interesting. I'm so glad thank to you catch very up with much. you. So, and thank you know, you. in COVID-19, one final word. Yeah. The interesting thing, as you mentioned about arbitration, is that it has been very adaptive and capable of working through COVID-19. So I call it the snow piercer if we're in yeah. winter, and it has managed to adapt and continue to uh, uh, work properly to the benefit of the parties and its users, uh, uh, whereas courts sometimes have been in shutdown mode. Yeah, no, that is a fantastic point. I actually was talking with um, someone who heads up the American Arbitration Association, they were talking about how they expect to see a flood of new filings because people are sick of waiting with the courts being closed. So they're just opting to arbitrate instead. So you're actually seeing more post-dispute arbitration agreements than we've ever seen before. So yeah. your point is very well taken. <laughs> well, thank you. thank you and have a wonderful day. And I really appreciate your taking the time with us. Great pleasure. Thank you very much, Amy, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye.